Well, welcome everyone uh, to session four, uh, best practices for optimizing your reach through YouTube. Uh, we're gonna spend the first 30 to 40 minutes or so uh, talking about putting podcasts on YouTubes, you know, the why, the how, things that one should consider uh, if you if you choose to do so. And then we're gonna open it up to questions and discussion because um, I imagine, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of interesting perspectives on this question. Um, and, you know, some of the themes that we'll, we'll be touching on, uh, you know, balancing the best practices for podcasting, which obviously is something that, uh, you know, this whole symposium uh, is discussing, balancing those uh, best practices with the best practices um, for YouTube as a platform, um, and you know how how do you how do you manage that balance? Uh, so first of all, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, so first of all, we have uh, Minyan Fogarty, who is perhaps better known to many of you as Grammar Girl. Um, she's the founder of Quick and Dirty Tips Network uh, and the creator of the Grammar Girl podcast and website, and well multimedia empire really um she has backgrounds in both english and science uh which is i think a really interesting thing and uh, she worked as a science writer before turning her hand to um educational uh online material uh for writing for writers um and then there is even mcmaster uh who is the co-founder of the endless knot podcast uh, about language and history, uh, and the producer of the Endless Knot YouTube channel. Uh, she is a former professor of classics and has a strong interest in public scholarship. Um, and myself, I'm Mark Sundaram. I'm the founder, writer, and presenter of the alliterative YouTube channel about etymology and history, and the co-founder, uh, along with Avon, uh, with, uh, uh, of the um, Endless Knot podcast. Uh, I have a BA in English, and I did graduate my graduate work in a medieval, medieval studies department. Uh, now I kind of think of myself as a historical linguist, uh, and I'm an instructor at Laurentian University in Canada. Uh, so I think uh, I, I'll start off by um, asking Minion about her experience with putting her podcast on YouTube. Thanks, Mark. Avon and Mark, it's so good to see both of you again, and <laughs> and thank you for thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. So um, I I'll start with saying I primarily think of myself as an audio podcaster. That's how I got started, but I've been mucking around on YouTube for about 14 or 15 years. So I've been experimenting with different ways of putting the podcast on YouTube um, or trying to use YouTube as a promotional tool for the podcast. And I think this this is simplistic, but there are, in my mind, two ways to think about sort of what you're doing with YouTube. It's like you can use it as a distribution platform for your podcast. Um, or you can use it as a marketing tool for your podcast. And, and you can be putting that audio up on YouTube, you know, in some way, whether that's with a cover slide or some simple art or a recording of your pod as you know, you as you record. Or, you know, some people make YouTube specific content. And I think YouTube first content is very different from audio first content. So, and there are people who started as YouTubers and then become audio podcasters. So it kind of goes both ways. And in some ways they are different kinds of content, but you can sort of mesh them together too and, and, and make it work. Um, so I've done, um, put the audio up with just a cover slide. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to make, um, more more inter more more visually interesting versions of the podcast. So I would take the audio podcast 
And then, well, but my show's Grammar Girl, so it's about language, and there are a lot of example sentences. So, you know, I would make sure that there was a slide for every example sentence that had the sentence on it, um, going to various degrees of, you know, highlighting the important words in that sentence as I was talking and using... Um, stock art to add visual interest. So, you know, people always had something to look at while they were listening to the podcast. And then um, I've also, I've more recently um, started doing interviews for the Grammar Girl podcast. And I record the interviews um, on Squadcast, I think it is, while we're doing it. And then we put the video up on YouTube. So those, are, and, and then I've done shorts, um, both vertical and horizontal. <laughs> and um uh, what did I learn? I learned that, um, sadly doing the, for me, I mean, this is all just my experience too. So, but for me doing the sort of highly produced version of the audio podcast with the changing cover slides, the stock art and the sentences just wasn't worth the time. I was really surprised. I loved doing it. I was really proud of the videos, but they just did not get much more traffic than just the cover slide which surprised me a lot, but that, that, that was the data we were getting. Um, the, uh, and again, another thing that surprised me. So the, um, record, the, the recordings of me doing interviews with my guest, they do do better than the cover slide, but not as much better as you would expect. Actually, I'm going to share my, um, screen. Um, wait, no, give me one sec. I'm going to, Oh, no. <laughs> what did I do? Um, oh, no. Okay. There we go. Uh, here we go. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. And because I have some data to show you just really quickly. But um, I went back for the last, I don't know, like this is like a month worth of data. And you can see um, the blue is my audio podcast with almost nothing but a cover slide. The red here are the interview shows. We took a break here, so that's why they're, it's sort of sparse, but we normally do interviews every week. You can see here, it's a little more. Like, so this is a week. So this is the regular show and the interview show. The regular show and the interview show. The interview show where you can see people talking, you know, it does a little bit better, but it's not nearly as much better as I would have guessed, given that people have something to watch versus not something to watch. And then the yellow is all the shorts. So while we took a break, we did uh, we did a short every day. This was an experiment. We hadn't done a lot of shorts before that, sort of sporadically. And so we did a short every day from one of the interviews while we took the break from the interviews shows. And they got, you know, varying levels of traffic, but they didn't do better. And we did not see an increase in subscribers beyond normal during that time. So releasing a short every day really just didn't do that much. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think one thing to think about always is why you are doing YouTube and what you're trying to get out of it. And because I loved making the cover slide videos and because I was so proud of them, I did them way longer than I should have. And, you know, at one point, I finally, I actually said to the people on my team, I'm like, make me stop because I should not be doing this, but I can't stop. And what's really interesting and maybe something for podcasters to think about is I took that time that I was using on the cover slide videos and put it into doing a second episode every week. We took that time into doing the interview shows. I mean, the interview show, they take a little bit more time, but you know, we captured those hours a week and put them into doing more audio work, um, which then actually is also YouTube work because we're putting it on YouTube and, and keeping that presence there. Um, so that's that's been really interesting. And then, you know, I, I think one more interesting thing to share while I'm rambling on here is that I usually work from a script, um, is that um, we had a recent hit recently. So, you know, we had, we had um, a regular interview show and no offense at all to the guest, but it was just a normal show. It wasn't extra special in any way. You know, we normally get, I would say like 500 to 800 views on a video. Like let's say this video now has 35,000 views. It just did 
uh, well above anything we've gotten, you know, out of the gate. And so we start, you know, obviously we're thinking about what happened, like what, what caused this totally normal show to become so much bigger. And again, I'm going to share my screen and show you I th one thing we think maybe, cause you never know, but uh, the thumbnail. So, um, you know, you always hear that the thumbnail really matters on YouTube. And I think that is what we found. Um, normally, you can see here on the right, these are the typical thumbnails we've been using. With They always have an orange background. You know, they're kind of fun. They have some some clip art, whatever. And we this one, the one in the upper left with Britishisms, um, talking about Britishisms, the thumbnail was really different from what we normally do. And I think that my guess is that that is what caused it to initially get attention. So then the second thing that I think played a role in that taking off is that it kind of made people angry. <laughs> um, and we got a lot of comments. Um, it was a comment, not everyone was angry. Some people, so it was about the difference between British English and American English, which is always a hot topic. And so people wanted to share their thoughts of British people on, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do that. Um, and then you got this wrong, I'm British and you got this wrong, you know? And so I think it has about 650 comments now. Um, it's been like six weeks and I'm still getting comments every morning. So I think that that level of engagement also once it once it got viewed from the thumbnail, then it started getting engagement and like, boom, you've got 35,000 views. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, so we've since then we've been, you know, and and like we haven't been able to replicate that. You know, I've put out maybe eight more videos since that happened. We are playing with the thumbnails more. Um, I have not um, tried to encourage engagement more than normal. So I haven't given that a try. But um, certainly it's something that if you want, if you really wanting to improve your traffic there, you should definitely focus on that too, I think. Um, so those are sort of my big takeaways. The, although the final takeaway I'll add is that, you know, we have, I do have some videos that, you know, have racked up tens of thousands of views over the years. And those are always the ones that do well in search. They're, you know, how to use a semicolon, how to diagram a sentence. So also if your videos do well in search, they can definitely accumulate views over time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's certainly true that the um, the YouTube algorithm loves engagement. So yeah, you know, when you have a topic that can spark that engagement, it will it will really help. And and I think you're absolutely right that you know this is what YouTube says again and again. Thumbnail thumbnails really matter. Um, and you know, you've kind of in a sense got a bit of A/B testing there. Uh, you know, with those examples. So. That's... Yeah. But then then I will say that we've tried to replicate it since then and haven't haven't <laughs> haven't hit on it. You know, we're trying right. different things, bigger text, more shocked looks on your face. You know, there are but there are people who are there are people whose whole job is thumbnail artist. And, you know, that's not what we do. So I think that's something for people to take away is, you know, things to play with if you're wanting to experiment. And, you know, don't don't get into the rut of always doing the same kind of thing if you're not getting the traffic you want. I, one more thing I thought of that I'll add is, you know, you know, I, I realized that like in the regular podcast, I never, I don't think I ever say this is a podcast. Um, so um, mm. I think that if you're trying to, if, if your goal is not to get your information to YouTubers, but to drive traffic to your podcast or do marketing for your podcast, and you're just putting your show up there, you need to think about like making sure that people know it's a podcast. Um, you know, I put it in the show notes, but you know, not everyone looks at those. So you yeah. want to say, you know, welcome to the podcast or subscribe to the podcast or something like that. So they know. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's certainly something that, you know, people can, because YouTube is good for discovery, which podcasts are kind of not. Um, and so it can be a gateway for people who might actually want to listen to it on a podcasting platform, uh, but find it on YouTube. And then, you know, if you mention, as you say, quite explicitly, this is a podcast, you can also <laughs> listen to it through your uh, podcatcher of, of choice. Um, that's a good driver to, to have subscribers 
uh, to the to the audio podcast. Yeah, I can't remember Mignon. Just I, I listen to your podcast, but I now can't remember because of course one tends to tune out the repeated stuff a little bit. Yeah. Do you mention in the podcast that it's on YouTube? No, almost never. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I have for years. <laughs> I think and at one I point I did. How much I, you know, that's one of those things where I don't know how much, I think the other way around, we at least think in theory, people will find it on, on YouTube and then go to, to subscribe on my podcast. I, my instinct is that doesn't happen a lot the other way around, that if you're already listening to podcasts in an audio form, you're unlikely to go search it out on YouTube. So it probably doesn't matter that much that you don't mention it, but it is, I suppose if we're talking about best practices, it would kind of make sense to cross promote that way to say it in in your, you know, uh, the stuff at the beginning or end where you kind of give all the information where to find you, et cetera, to say, yeah. you know, this is a podcast available on podcasts, uh, podcasters and on YouTube and, you know, whatever. But I, I say that I, uh, I feel like this best practices discussion may be, at least from Mark and me, a fairly long series of, I think this would be a best practice and we don't actually do it, I think is what I'm <laughs> going to do a lot of, do as I say, not as I do, um, for reasons that we can get into, but but I think that might be one one to sort of think about, that imagine yeah. at any point that the person listening might not know that you exist in the other formats. Right. Yeah. And you reminded me, Mark, of um, some work by Tom Webster from Sounds Profitable recently. They're a research firm that looks at podcasting. And he said that, uh, I think, I don't know, it was like, it was a big number, like 75% of um, podcast lis listeners found their favorite podcast on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I, I might not have that number right, but the big picture is true that a lot of people found their favorite podcast on YouTube, even if they end up listening on audio. Mm -hmm. And he found yeah. he also found that a lot of people listen to both, like depending on where they are. And, you know, if they're in their car, they'll listen to the audio. If they're computer they'll listen they'll turn on the youtube so it doesn't seem like is it is quite as either or as i was thinking mm -hmm. um the other th especially i was watching your your wonderful shorts this morning mark and um i was reminded in shorts it's even harder to get the context of who is putting out that content you just have mm -hmm. the tiny icon in the corner with your name yep. so i think if there's so, you know having a graphic or something that says like from the podcast you know could yeah. also yeah. be especially important for shorts if if you're wanting to use it as some to drive people to your podcast mm -hmm. yep and yeah, as, as a, a YouTuber friend of mine um, always says, uh, you know, YouTube is the second biggest search engine. Um, people go to YouTube to find something out. And so it is, it can be useful to direct people in that, you know, in that way. But I am, I'm aware of at least one um, podcast that does direct traffic the other way, uh, you know, and says, and if you, you know, when he's demonstrating something, he says, and if you go and watch this in the video version, you can see whatever. Uh, and so there may be some people who, you know, start off listening, uh, but, you know, decide to, oh, well, yeah, maybe I should go and watch it on YouTube for the, for that visual component. Mm -hmm. Maybe that can be a segue into talking about uh, a little more about why one, and you, I mean, you already brought this up, Mignon, but about why to put podcasts on YouTube. You know, what yeah. I, so we've, I think we've really touched on the, a few of the reasons yeah. why discoverability, but yeah, what other reasons um, are there for, for doing this? You know, if you're, if you're a podcaster and are considering, uh, you know, is this something I should do? What are the, what are the pros anyways, for, for, you know, starting to, uh, to put your content on YouTube as well? Yeah. I mean, I've noticed that my audience is much more international on YouTube than for the podcast. I don't know if that would be true for everyone, but, um, you know, I looked at my analytics this morning to be sure. And, uh, like only 40% of my YouTube audience is in the United States, which is, you know, much lower than for the audio podcast. So, you know, I, I'd had a sense of that from the comments that I get, but, but seeing it this morning was like, that's, that is, that is quite surprising. Um, so you, you, you must have much more international reach. And I imagine that part of that, and I, I think this is, well, that might be true for both scripted and non-scripted, but uh, one of the things that YouTube has is, auto, even if you don't do it, it has automated captions. Yeah. And for a non, you know, somebody who doesn't speak the language, 
that it's in primarily, having captions along with the audio is going to be hugely helpful. And some, some YouTube language, some, some things are automatically translated. It depends what language you're translating into, and there's a bunch of limitations on that. Once upon a time, you could do translations and upload them, and your community could, up, sorry, your community could upload translations onto, pod, onto YouTube, which was amazing. But unfortunately, that's not possible anymore. Yeah. But hmm. um, yeah, they started to get abused by some people who would put offensive things, and when anyway, oh. it got removed. It was very frustrating. But uh, but nonetheless, like the, even on automated AI driven translation um, may give and I imagine for your podcast in particular, since people who are learning English would have reason to want to watch your show about how to use a semicolon or whatever, uh, having that audio reinforced by the by the caption would be really helpful, I think. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's yes. Well, and, and there is also a kind of generational factor to this that, you know, people of younger generations than, than myself uh, like to have captions on all the time for things yeah. anyways, you know, even for TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they just may enjoy consuming podcasts that way with captions going. So because yeah. even if yeah. you provide a transcript, which we do, uh, you know, having you you have to pull up the transcript and have that in front it's yeah. not the same as captions it, 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 it's not as uh useful so that's i think yeah, yeah. um i mean well, i have a stat <laughs> I have a stat. So we upload um, edited versions of our transcript for the captions and right. we get about 20, it looks like about 20% of people watch it with the captions on. Right. So. right. Which, is, which is not negligible by any means, you know, like in terms of, um, I think the, some other ones that I just would bring up, I mean, you've already talked about that there's just a lot of people on YouTube and there's a lot of people who do watch podcasts on YouTube. And, and I, but I also think uh, there's a fair number of people who treat YouTube as a podcast player by like, but don't watch it. Mm -hmm. That is, they will turn off the, the, if you have, if you have um, YouTube premium or whatever, you can turn off the screen and continue to listen. And so you can treat it as an audio podcast, but use YouTube. And because it's, you know, the subscriptions work. And if you are already doing that with, for, with, for other things, I think there are people who are just there already that you might want to reach. Um, and I think this is not just discoverability and search, but you know, the suggestions, so if your YouTube is on there, it'll come up as a suggested viewing. YouTube will push it in certain contexts in a way that I know it does happen on podcast apps, but it's uh, much more limited. Like there's very much more, you know, it'll be the top five or 10 podcasts that ever turn up in mm -hmm. that category. Whereas on YouTube, it'll be much more tailored to the individual person. Mm -hmm. So it might, your stuff might Yeah. It, I mean, it's the mixed blessing of the algorithm. You know, if, if you're able to, um, kind of play the algorithms game well, it can really work in your favor. Um, it can also, you know, <laughs> not work in your favor, yeah. um, but it, that it's an aspect that you don't necessarily have just through audio only um, podcast platforms. Yeah, um, and, and just a couple more things. And then I think maybe we should talk a little bit about how to do this, mm -hmm. if you're gonna do it. Um, the, you already brought up comments. And I do think like one of the great drop drawbacks slash blessings of podcasts is that you don't get comments. It's very hard, you know, very few people, very few apps even have comments. And when they do, people don't use them that much. So YouTube engagement and community can be easier to build on YouTube. It can also be toxic. And I think maybe we can come back to that. Um, and the visual aspect, there are some podcasts, I listened to a podcast about art history and they would put the paintings that they were talking about up on their YouTube videos. And obviously that's, you know, an, an easy, uh, an easy win. Um, two more things I just want to say quickly before we move on. Um, the, uh, it allows live streams, which I think some people might like, mm -hmm. like live doing live podcasts is something you could do on YouTube, but it's hard to do. Uh, and that can be something that you can, you know, offer as a, a perk for um, support for like, uh, you know, people who are either directly as channel members on YouTube or, um, you know, through Patreon, you can you can offer those live streams as a kind of perk. So and then uh, 
that there's the analytics. You've been showing us the analytics. And, you know, yeah. You know, I know there are podcast analytics, but you usually have to pay for them. The YouTube ones are free. And in many ways, they're very detailed to a degree that can, again, be toxic. I'm just going to say, like, I think there's a real pro and con about watching your analytics. You can, you can start to fall down. You can start to care too much about them. Uh, sometimes I love podcasts because I don't know how many people are listening on a, on a given day because I don't really pay that much attention to my analytics. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say is also uh, monetization. Uh, I know that as academic and educational podcasters, that may not be our consideration. And it's not easy to monetize on YouTube. You have to have, there's a reasonably high threshold now for subscribers and view time. But it is at least theoretically possible to have a fairly passive monetization on YouTube in a way without having, without having to do the sort of getting ads and subscribers, at least in theory, depending how successful it is. Sorry, I just wanted to, to drop those. <laughs> Yeah, I guess one more final um, benefit may be that if, especially if you're doing something where people are seeing you, it can help you, you know, build a sense of um, connection with your listeners, probably more than just, just audio. So, so if you decided then that, yeah, okay, I'm going to start putting my uh, podcast onto YouTube, how does one do it? So there's one really easy way now that did not used to exist. Um, and we haven't quite done it that way because it, it didn't exist when we started out. If you start a YouTube pod, a, a podcast, a regular podcast, and it will produce an RSS feed, uh, you can upload an RSS feed into YouTube and it will automatically post your YouTube videos, uh, your, your, your episodes as videos. And it's, it, you have to create a YouTube channel uh, then you go into YouTube Studio, which is where you do anything. If you have a YouTube channel, it's like to create a YouTube channel, all you need is a Gmail account. It's a Google account. And you create a Google account. It can be your own, but I would strongly suggest having a separate one for your podcast. And then you go in and you click, click create new podcast. You follow the directions. Basically, you give it the URL or the, the of, of your podcast and the RSS and you upload a, a channel image. And it will just literally upload everyone as you as you release it and it'll upload it it'll put a static image of your channel on it and the title that your RSS feed gives it and it'll go. That's the most basic way to do it and but it's it works so that's the, the first that's one way of doing it. Um, and it'll have automated captions and it'll it'll be it'll be posted. And it'll it'll upload your whole back catalog, and then from then on it will do the um, the new ones. Yeah, like you, um, I'm not doing it that way no, either no. because I have such an established channel. For, um, it's just hard to doesn't make sense to switch. But, yeah. um, for the for the um, for the interviews, we we edit in Descript, mm -hmm. and so it's really easy in Descript to, you know, export audio and then you know, add slides, in, a few slides and not get carried away and export uh, the video. So it's, it's, I think, you know, the, the introduction of tools like Descript has been pretty revolutionary in making it easier to, you know, turn your audio into slightly produced or, or extensively in, it produced video. It's much easier than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, you can have templates and, and things like that that make it pretty quick. And if you do it that way now, um, and that's how we, not in Descript, but in another, because we also run a video channel, we're used to doing video uh, editing. So we would just do it, do a, a video and then um, upload it to the YouTube channel just as a normal YouTube video, which is a very easy process. Honestly, YouTube makes it very easy to upload just a video. And then the now there's, you can declare it a podcast basically in YouTube by going through this process, you just say, this playlist you make you put add all the videos to a playlist and you say this playlist is a podcast and it sort of puts a little podcast label on it and now whenever it turns up in people's youtube videos it will have a little marker that says this is a podcast and it will put all of the episodes in order for them so that is also a possibility especially if you want to do the rss feed will only really work if all you want is a static image and and the audio so it's low effort, but it's also low production. Yeah. Um, 
but I think I mean like I, I almost don't like I almost don't have any more advice about how because it's really very straightforward to do yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but if there are people who have some questions when, when we move into the question period like feel free to ask more details because sometimes if you've been doing things a long time you forget the, yeah the things you don't the things I didn't know 10 years ago when we started <laughs> yeah so maybe now we should um you know address some of the the questions to consider um if you're going to do this and specifically thinking of the be the best practices um we've i guess we touched on you know do you have a dedicated channel or um or podcasts uh, or is it you know being a, a mixture of um, podcast material and other types of videos um you know, do you do you just repurpose the audio from your podcast straightforwardly? You know, as as we said, do it through uh, an RSS feed, or do you kind of put a little more work into it and craft specifically um, specific videos uh, for your podcast? And the thing is, it's interesting as you look at the YouTube best practices. Like, if you go to YouTube, when they when, when YouTube talks about podcasts, their assumption is that your podcast, I mean, they give you this way of doing, if you've got a podcast existing, here's the way to put it on, that's fine. But all of their best practices focus on made for YouTube video, podcasts. So they're very, very strong on, they've got a bunch of analytics about why you should have video of people in it. It should be people and in interviewing, maybe other images and stuff, but really you should show the hosts talking that that is their the most successful podcast format for that that in their view, uh, and I'm you know I'm sure they're right, uh, and that the that it should be focused on YouTube first. You should start with you know uh, uh, start with start right into it, not do the usual kind of podcast intros. That in other words, you should use the best practices of YouTube videos, which is you're going to lose most people within the first twelve seconds, so you've got to hook them right away. You've got like those kinds of things uh, are the way that YouTube suggests you write your podcast. And I think that's where the, you know, where this, the tension can be between, especially for, honestly, especially for an educational or academic podcast, you know, a lot of the things that make a YouTube video successful are, if not are either not the kinds of things we necessarily are wanting to do in our podcasts or might even be directly contrary to some of the things we want to do in our podcasts. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed um, one thing I've definitely noticed looking at like what makes successful YouTube content versus, you know, what I do mm -hmm. is that um, they get into it so fast, yeah. you know, like it start, there's no, you know, there's no introducing your guest. Yeah. It's just jumping in to the first question. Let's go. You know, and uh, you can do that with editing. Um, you know, you could take a clip from the middle of like the most interesting part of an interview or something and throw it at the beginning, you know, and 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 I know NPR says that's important for podcast listening too, that you lose people quickly if you don't have something up front, but it seems even more dramatic to me on YouTube. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess that... because it's so easy to flip away on YouTube, right? Whereas with a podcast, you're not gonna, you know, turn you know, off or something or switch to not and yeah forward and... <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so easy to to you know flip to the next thing on youtube that yeah you do have to make them want to keep listening yeah very quickly i i see that kimberly in the chat asked about tiktok if if we've done tiktok videos and and i did i um i i, I did tiktok for probably about a year i'm still there and i i racked up i i think about 30,000 followers. Um, I had some videos do well. I had a video that did, um, you know, 300,000, 500,000 views. I found it particularly difficult. I mean, I never, ever saw an increase in podcast traffic from anything I did there. And when I tried to mention the podcast, I would get no views. Like the algorithm there is just brutal. Like if you're trying to direct people to anything, it's really hard. Um, I, I was not able to find a way to make it work. I know I've seen some people like wear sweatshirts that have their podcast on, you know, say like podcast or have something in the background visually. Um, TikTok favors things that are very similar over and over. Um, you know, so they'll find that someone likes 
a certain style of your videos. And then if you do more of exactly those, you might get put in front of them in the algorithm again. But if you try to switch and do something different, um, you'll just get no views again. Um, I ended up, and, and the comments can be really overwhelming. Like we're talking about um, YouTube comments, but TikTok comments, my husband would laugh at me because anytime I'd get a video that did really well, I would get like hundreds of comments and I get really overwhelmed and I would like disappear for two weeks because I just couldn't deal with it. So, um, and then even if they weren't awful, it's just trying to like acknowledge 300 people have said like, cool, you know, I mean, it's just, I, I find it personally very overwhelming. So, um, and I wasn't getting much out of it. So I hardly ever do it anymore. Yeah. And I, I think maybe that's something to just quickly bring up. Um, maybe we can discuss it more with the group if there are questions, but um, if you venture into this place where there is more inter engagement, it is great and can be great to build community. There's a community tab on YouTube. There's, you know, there's comments, uh, but it comes with a whole set of possible problems, not just hate and yeah. people being mean about what you look like, which is bad enough, obviously. But yeah, <laughs> even good comments. Do you respond to them? How much time do you don't put into it? And it is true that on YouTube, um, and this is the trap of the algorithm, you know, you you put your finger on it. Why did that particular video do so well? Well, one is definitely that it makes people riled up because they want to argue about what is British and what is American, what is better and what is worse. And it's a real problem for educational YouTubers in general that YouTube wants you to do something controversial. It wants you to make your because bad comments drive the engagement, just drive the algorithm just as much as good comments. You know, somebody swearing at you in your comments in, is going to get, it's going to make your video more promoted just as much as somebody saying that was a great video. And so making, and that is, you know, that's pretty direct. Sure, we, we might be interested in doing controversial topics as academics or as humanities podcasters for their own sake, but, you know, it, it's what leads to clickbait and, and just, you know, doing polarizing polarizing topics all the time because that's going to get you the views is um can be a problem yeah the video i had that did really well was a, a confusing grammar rule and people ended up arguing in the comments about whether i was right or not mm -hmm. and you know i i probably spent 10 hours trying to engage and explain and you know it, it didn't help like it really didn't help everyone just kept arguing it was it was out of control mm -hmm. yeah. well maybe we should um kind of open up the floor a little bit and uh, i'm sure we will other things will occur to us um to, to add but uh as we go through but uh open the floor to some questions and comments um so if you if you have a question and comment or comment, uh, I think we'll, you'll now have the ability to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Or feel free to just put it in or, the chat. Too. Or just put it in the chat. That's also good, too. And while we're waiting for some of those, um, hmm. Have you, are, are there any other points that um, you wanted, either of you wanted to make that we haven't touched on? Well, I might actually, mm -hmm. there is a question in the chat uh, from Brooke that ah, kind yes. of, uh, do you think that YouTube is a net gain, net loss, is it worth it? I really think, like with most things, it depends what you, what you think it's going to be good for, like why you would, um, why you're going to be on it. We use the YouTube channel for our video for our podcast quite passively. Um, that is, I uh, I do the I don't do it through an RSS feed, but I just make a quite simple video. It doesn't take very much work. I put it up. It's there. We have about six hundred subscribers. We get you know a hundred views on an episode. It's not a ton, but it also does not add substantially to my work load because I don't do very much with it. And obviously that that's probably one of the reasons we don't get that many views. So I think of it as a net gain because that's, you know, hundred people who are hearing the podcast who wouldn't otherwise, 
uh, we get comments. There's one particularly nice dedicated comment to your comments on every video and always says something nice or interesting. And like, I like that. And um, that is, so it's a positive. If my goal was to broaden our reach and really promote it, at the moment, it probably wouldn't be worth the time because it's not doing that a lot. I would have to put more time in and then it becomes more of a question. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree, like with everything you just said. <laughs> um, we have I have one or two really positive, dedicated commenters, and it always makes me so happy when I see um, mm -hmm. their comments every week. Um, it, I, I don't put a ton of time into it, and, you know, that's probably why it's not getting, you know, huge numbers of views, but then it did one time, which always gives me hope. Um, but, yeah, I must say, like, financially, it it's definitely not worth it. I mean, I can we we I get probably about fifty thousand views a month, and I make one hundred and fifty to maybe two hundred twenty five dollars. I mean, it, it financially, it's just not not worth it. And one thing that surprised me, um, shorts, I, like like that all comes from videos. I think I made a dollar and twenty five yeah. cents from shorts shorts last cents. month. I mean, <laughs> shorts are money. definitely not worth it. <laughs> no, the percentage is a lot lower on on shorts. So uh, it's and shocking. I, I I will say, um, I think uh, it also depends what you do. If if what you want out of YouTube is promoting your podcast, then I think you have to take it different, like specifically, uh, maybe you aren't uploading the podcast itself all the time, and then you're only putting little clips and reels and, and that, and I think that might be an interest, like, I think that might be worth it as well in a different way, because it gives you a, a way of, of, but if you're thinking about advertising rather than putting up every episode, then, then it's just a good advertising platform, I think. So, you know, that sort of depends what your purpose is too. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So just like not to put the podcast on YouTube, yeah. but to just put clips and promotions and try harder to drive people so to it, the podcast. I, I yeah. saw somebody suggesting uh, cherry picking, taking your four or five sort of most YouTube friendly episodes and putting those up so that there is sort of a sample there and then focusing on clips and shorts and you know promotional stuff oh sorry uh short yeah the, see this is the stuff you forget uh, there is a technical designation on youtube called a short which is vertical video rather than horizontal the the aspect ratio is vertical uh they used to be only one minute long and they just literally a month ago expanded to up to three minutes long they can now be up to three minutes long uh and they are promoted different like there's a different sort of algorithm on youtube but they it's sort of like a TikTok. it was it was a response to TikTok. they wanted to be like TikTok, so it's sort of like a TikTok. Uh, and you when you are creating them you upload them slightly differently it's not too different anymore but it's it's treated slightly different by the way the platform works and then it appears in a different feed essentially yeah yeah but it's on the same channel and and them and as we just said the monetization when it comes to it is different too. Yeah, October 15th, I think, is when they changed the limit. It's three minutes now. Yep. So, and I think you um, TikTok's long, you can do longer ones on TikTok too. But yeah, you can already do. Anyway, I don't fully understand. We are on TikTok as well, but we do that as, um, it's more to promote our YouTube, our main YouTube channel uh, rather than podcast, but obviously it could go either way. Um, I don't think it drives people off the platform either. I think it's it's its own ecosystem. Yeah. I think people who are on TikTok watch things on TikTok. They do not go looking for those creators elsewhere. That's my view. Yeah. And you, you, it's, hard, it's hard to put links yeah. in really unless you have a certain threshold. So, you know, the thing that's hard, Josh, Josh, we've got a we've got a contrary view in the in the in the uh, comments, which is interesting. Oh, sorry, that's shorts, not TikTok, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do think shorts drive views. Yeah. And drive subscribers on YouTube. I do. Yeah. yeah we, we get more views on our shorts, but um, yeah. You know, and another interesting thing about that video that we had that did especially well, we did, we did pick up more subscribers, but then actually our views were down on the following um, videos. Yeah. I mean, they are, they were notice, notice, not dramatically, but noticeably down for like the next month afterward. Like well, I have no that idea. Can be, you can get punished by YouTube for a successful video in terms of how the algorithm works, because huh. if your next video is not exactly like it and mm -hmm. doesn't hit all the same buttons and doesn't have the same engagement, then YouTube says, oh, well, 
<laughs> obviously nobody likes this anymore and like stop serving it you're very much at the you know the whim of, of for, for a, a video like that is only getting all those views because it's being served it's being shown to mm -hmm. new people uh and if youtube's algorithm does not show it to new people there's nothing it does not matter how good the video is nobody will see it so it's yeah. it's a yeah interesting and many many youtubers don't look at their subscription feed so uh That's they'll subscribe to a channel but then yeah. never know that there's a new video out yeah because it's it ha doesn't come up automatically uh sorry I, I know we're talking a lot i don't know i can't see if there's anyone if you want to raise your hand if anyone wants to have a, if there are any questions in the that people want to unmute for maybe i know that i will always talk to fill dead air so <laughs> Yeah, yes. our, I mean, just talking about the, the the sort of relation between podcast and podcasts and videos, we kind of had a circular uh, journey through that because we started off on YouTube and then started converting some of our YouTube videos into podcasts, just sort of reusing the audio, and, the and then strangely put those podcast mm -hmm. versions. On, back onto YouTube as audio only. So, yeah. So there's parts of some, not all of our videos, not not all of our episodes, but some of our episodes are from the of the podcast contain just the audio from originally YouTube videos, which we then take that audio and convert it back into a video and upload it to a different channel. As of so, I'll be like, oh, I have to upload the video of the audio of the video. <laughs> it's like this is ridiculous but i mean uh i think that's like can be you can think of it that way that what you're also getting to do is repurposing content and content takes a lot of effort to create putting it on different platforms in a fairly similar way is a way to efficiently repurpose that pot that content and that can mean you know so that you can get viewers or whatever or so that if you think that the stuff you're producing is something that you, you know, think the world will be better off for listening to, which I think a lot of us do, uh, it just means you're able to get that, you know, serve that out to the world in another platform. And if people find it, they find it, you know. Raven, we had a general question mm -hmm. from the chat that was a little earlier up. It said, have you guys made TikTok videos? We're thinking about making some to promote our podcast, but we're not sure it's a good idea. Yeah, I think um, we spoke a little bit about that, but uh, Mignon does, you know, yeah. I, that's what I was going to say that I forgot. So um, it, I think it depends on your goal. Because the one thing that's, you know, like I said, we never saw any traffic going from TikTok to the podcast. But I think there's something to be said for building a brand over time. Um, you know, and so if people see you on on TikTok or they see you on YouTube shorts and they become familiar with your brand, whether it's Endless Knot or Grammar Girl or whatever, if they see you somewhere else, they may be more likely to listen when they're looking for a podcast, which might not be right after they've seen your TikTok video. They might not click through, but you know, PR in general can be really hard to measure and it takes time to build. So I think there's an argument to be made for the fact that even though we can't see a direct relationship between, you know, being on YouTube and getting traffic, um, it I'm I'm almost certain it's there to some extent. It's just really hard to measure. And, you know, even if you're seeing, well, okay, our traffic, even if your traffic is going down, well, maybe it would have gone down more if you weren't on TikTok or Reels or YouTube Shorts. So it, it, it can be hard to measure, but I think I, 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 I believe personally that, you know, being in front of people reminds them you exist and then they're more likely to engage with, your content, whether it's a book or a podcast or a YouTube video. Yeah, I mean, the basic idea of name recognition, which we know that advertisers care about deeply, um, just that next time you see that name, you'll know what it is. There's a reason advertisers care about it. Um, can I address the, the one of the ch questions from Lamar in the chat um, mm -hmm. about monetization? The basic monetization option is really, the, the straightforward one is that if you can hit a certain level, you need a thousand subscribers, I think right now, and 4,000 hours viewing hours within 
the last year. There's a couple of other little different ways it can be, but essentially there's a sort of minimum threshold. If you do that, you can apply for, you can become a YouTube partner, which means you start to get a portion of the advertising revenue. The ads are automatically added to your videos. You can't stop them being added to your videos no matter what, but until you're a partner, you don't get any of the money from it. Once you're a partner, you get a portion of it. So you get a certain amount of money per view. Uh, or for viewers who have YouTube premium and therefore don't see ads, you yeah. get a percentage of their yeah. YouTube premium fee. Depend, um, you know, uh, based on how many views you have and things. Uh, it's not like Minion said, it's not a lot, but I mean, it can be if you have lots and lots of views and lots and lots of watch time, which is one thing the podcasts are nice is they tend to be longer. longer. So that's pretty good. Um, you also can get sponsors and do ad, you know, do in enroll ads just like you could for a podcast. But that that isn't really any different. But the fact that there, and th so, so there's another like way them. that you can monetize, which is through channel memberships, and that's a newer um, element to the platform. Uh, and I don't think there is a threshold for that. I think you can do that at. I'm, I'm not positive about that, or maybe the threshold is lower. It might, I think um, it might be a lower threshold. Lower I don't think threshold. It may have a subscriber limit, but not a view time limit. I, I just right. Like um, uh, and so basically what you people do is join as channel members, and then they can potentially have um, members-only content um, that they get that the general uh, viewer doesn't get. So it's like a paid subscription. Um, and of course, you can do Patreon and stuff like that, but that's there anyway. Uh, and just to answer about those uh, placements of ad, you can, um, you can turn on or turn off mid-roll ads uh, and allow, if you turn off mid-roll ads, there will only be ads at the beginning or end or both of your video. If you turn on mid-roll ads, it'll place it in the middle, but you can choose. You can like say, yeah, on it choose specifically where it goes. Before yeah. that, you can't, I don't think. Um, you can say, you know, I want it at minute 23 or whatever. You can, you can do that. For each one so you can decide that mid-roll ads pay more uh but uh, obviously you know there's the reasons against it so yeah mm -hmm. but you can choose yeah. uh and engagement strategies to encourage listeners i think one of the things we've never done and we haven't really talked about here but i think could be a way of doing it is you could not do entirely new videos ep new episodes for youtube but you could for instance put a different top or tail or like you were talking about mignon like re-edit your video a little bit to, to put a little highlight right at the beginning or something. And you could certainly add in an engagement piece that said something like, here's a, you know, here's a question for you. What do you think about blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I tend not to do that on podcasts most of the time, because I know that nobody's, you know, unless it's a really big deal, they're not going to send me an email about it. And they're never going to go to my website and leave a comment there. But on a YouTube video, the chance that they will actually write something in the comments is much higher. And so you might want, you know, maybe that would be a thing is you, and maybe you don't want that in the audio version, but maybe you add in like a little segment where you ask a question, ask a question, ask someone to tell you their personal experience about something or say something provoking that will make them mad and comment. Mm -hmm. you, you choose the strategy. <laughs> and you can attach polls. So, you know, that's a way of, you know very specifically you can say select you know your what you think is the right answer to this right answer to this or whatever um and i would say also live streaming i really do think we yeah. we've we're every time we do we've done it for sort of big markers on our other youtube channel like big subscriber markers and milestones and every time we do it, we think, why don't we do this more often? We get wonderful comments and questions and feedback, and it's great. Live streaming on YouTube is really easy, and people can just join and comment, and, and it's great. And then every time we do it, we don't do it again for like a year and a half because we forget to do it and we just never get around to it. But I would say that that's like, if you do a live stream, that drives engagement by almost by definition. If anyone turns up to it and asks any question or does anything, um, so a live stream Q and A or a live stream where you, you know, depending what your podcast is, where you do something related to your topic, or you read a read a book or watch a movie together, or like there's a whole bunch of different things you could do that would drive engagement on the live stream. But it would also sort of it 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 does build community among your group um, in a way that is harder to do on a podcast, I think. 
it's very easy to get or the podcasts are really good for that parasocial relationship between the host and audience but they are not as good at developing a community among the audience right because they don't have a way to speak to one another so. and i guess the other tool that that youtube has for communities is the community tab mm -hmm. um, where you can post text or images or polls or whatever um and, uh, you know, that can just be another way of promoting your podcast. So that's a place where you can put, you know, the link to your podcast um, as a community post. Yeah, I was going to talk about that, too, and see, see if you knew more about it. Actually, I've experimented with it a tiny bit, and I was um, surprised. I, I thought nobody would engage with a text post on YouTube, but I actually did get, you know, a fair number of people commenting or replying to a poll when I would post it. Um, and it seemed like, and, and you know, and it, it it takes, you know, as much time as doing, you know, Facebook or Blue Sky. So it's mm -hmm. not nearly as heavy a lift as as video. Um, and so you found that too, that, that that's a good way to engage with people? I think so. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think it leads to, uh, it also cynically makes YouTube think people are engaging with your channel, right? Mm. Like, so it also, it, that is another way of driving YouTube to think that people care about your channel, which is helpful for them. So myself. Um, John, did you have a, a question you wanted to ask? I saw that you... No? Okay. I thought I saw you I unmuted for a moment. <laughs> it's all good. Um, yeah, we, we've, we mostly use, we don't do a lot of polls on it, but I have done polls a couple of times and every time there's, yeah, like surprisingly, yeah, surprising levels of reaction, <laughs> given that I never respond to polls on YouTube. Yeah, I don't either. I am not a typical YouTube user and I have to remember that a lot too. Yeah. Mm hmm yeah, it's easy to forget it's there because you think of video at, at YouTube as video, but it has this whole little back channel of text stuff. Mm -hmm. um, oh, one thing you can do on YouTube that I just wanted to mention, because if you haven't used it a lot, um, either way as a creator or not, you might not know, that, and it's relatively new as a thing, is YouTube allows you to write, um, put timestamps in the in the description in such a way that it breaks the YouTube the video up into chapters. So you may have just noticed this in particular, um, instructional videos tend to do this now, where like you can skip to the bit where they show you how to tighten the washer the right way or whatever. And uh, I think for, especially for an educational video and this, or a YouTube podcast or one where you have sort of very explicit or distinct segments, putting that into the chapters um, would be a nice way people can skip around or and they can even just like look in the comment, in the discussion section to see oh what are, what are they going to discuss here's this sort of gives a little table of contents too uh we again have not done that but i do think you know our videos are our podcasts are more than an hour long it would probably be super smart if i did that because and i had to be honest i'd sort of forgotten that was a thing um when i was preparing for this i was like oh my goodness i should be 100 percent doing that why am i not doing that and it also, again, allows a bit of SEO because if you put in the words that label the sections, you know, what your topics are going to be, that's yep. more for YouTube to go off of when choosing what your video is about and helping with search. Yeah, any text in your description uh, is read by the, the algorithm and, and used. And it becomes a searchable thing too. And becomes searchable, yeah, as well. I see that um, Mary Ellen asked about what kind of questions we ask in our polls. The reason I was doing polls is um, I think it was last year I do I did a, a word of the year um, almost like a basketball bracket, and so I would put I, I solicited um, suggestions for word of the year for my followers on other social media, and then I was creating polls to say okay this word or that word, and they would pick one, and then that the the winner would move forward in the bracket toward the the word of the year. And, and I just happened to notice that um, YouTube had this polling function as well. So I put it up there too and, and was surprised that I actually got responses. Mm -hmm. well, on, on a video, not a, a podcast, but we could do the same thing on our podcast. Um, we had one where like the topic of the podcast was what's the earliest English word? Like how far back can we go for in a textual source that we could say counts as English? 
Um, you know, does it actually still count as English? Where did it have to, whatever? And so we listed a po bunch of pos possibilities and then we had a poll that was, well, what do you think? You know, which of our six possibilities did you think it was? And that, that video went up years and years ago and it's, people still answer it. People are still like, I'd like to, I want to weigh in on that. <laughs> you know, six years old now, but that's fine. I still want to weigh in on it. Um, I've seen a lot of people do, and this is only useful if you would be open to it, taking the answer from this, but one of the types of polls is, what topic would you like me to do next? Or here are four subjects I'm thinking of covering, which of these is of most interest to you? That of course has that wonderful uh, aspect of making your audience feel like they're engaged in the creation of your podcast, which is yeah. um, you know, a very nice feeling and tends to drive identification with, with from your audience. So those are some possibilities, possible possibilities, sorry. I'm interested in hearing more about your live streams um, because when I, when I do them, I feel like maybe five people show up and it feels like really empty and awkward. Like, do you get more people or how, how do you manage that? I mean, it, it can often start, you know, at the very beginning with only a handful of people. But usually, if you know, if you're doing a long enough live stream, I, I think we found that we've had not a huge number, but, you know, a healthy number to the point where the questions are coming in, um, you know, that we, you know, we don't have to sit, a, we don't have dead air, <laughs> you know, well, we always and, have questions to answer. I will say again, that this, this is on our other channel where we do have a much higher subscriber count and yeah. people are more video, you know, savvy as it were. But what we have done, they've always been Q and A's and we've always uh, solicited questions beforehand. And that's one of the things we've used the community tab for yeah. is we've posted in the community tab and said, please, you know, send us emails or, or, or comment, you know, respond to this community tab post with questions you might have and we'll gather them. So we've put it out and we've done in the podcast, we've, cause we kind of combine podcast and video listeners as it were. And so we've on the podcast, we said, we've have a live stream coming up, please email us any questions or put them in. And we've got on Patreon and, you know, and all of our various and on social media and sort of culled a bunch of questions to start off so that we have those and we've done a little research on them ahead of time. And then people can also post in the chat. And so we've, we've done them. It, I will say it's, it's helpful that there's two of us. So for those for whom this was not obvious already, Mark and I are married and live in the same house. We just have different offices. Um, so we're both on screen together and we're able to talk to one another, which, you know, lessens the awkwardness a little bit, I think. Um, and like, I can read the questions out to Mark and then he can answer them. But we've always had, um, I'd say we've always had like, you know, 10 to 40 people, right? Like it goes up or down at least. And that's the number of people who are commenting. I think mm. I think maybe we've maxed out at viewership live at like 100, but um, not for very long. But then mm -hmm. those live streams stay up and people yeah. can watch them afterwards. And they do. Um, shockingly <laughs> like i wouldn't <laughs> i'm gonna be very honest i don't watch live streams after they go up. i do i do watch live streams yeah. afterwards because i can't always i'm not always free to to join in at the time but you know i still want them interested in you know mm -hmm. what's said so i i i just rewatch. it sounds like you do a good job of promoting them too ahead of time yeah it definitely that's, helps that's yeah. important um, I know a lo fair number of people who do them as uh, as Patreon bonuses or something like that. And then if you already have an audience. So, you know, that's that's not a way of gaining new audience. That's a way of interacting with and developing the ties that you have to the audience. Building the community. Yeah. So, but, but it can be, but that can be really nice. And so one thing I will just say too, as a last sort of point for YouTube, I know I've said, the comments can be exhausting uh, too, but I find podcasting one of the great drawbacks is how little interaction you get, how little feedback you get, you know, for the, for the number, however much your number of people who listen to you and presumably enjoy it because they listen every week, the amount of actual feedback you're going to get is tiny. Like it's such a tiny, I know you like Mignon, you have, you have a particular audio feedback way to let people talk about themselves yeah which i think is brilliant yeah, the, because everybody the family act themselves. portion is always yeah, yeah are always great thing. so and that's so I, you get more feedback but like we get almost yeah. no feedback on the podcast via the podcast and so even having just like the occasional live stream and the comments on youtube 
um, you know, one nice comment can <laughs> can keep me going for quite yeah. a few months of feeling like you're not just talking into the void. And I have talked elsewhere at HPN events and else and other places about the danger of getting sort of burned out and overwhelmed by like, how do you even know I'm succeeding? Like, what's even the point of doing this when it's a lot of work to podcast? Getting a little bit of interaction with the people who enjoy your show or who learned from it or who were touched by it or who, you know, whatever, uh, does wonders. Mm -hmm. So that. That would be my, that would probably be my biggest <laughs> um, reason to suggest doing it, very honestly. Mm-hmm. And advice for adding, <laughs> and advice for adding kindness to the world, like leave a nice comment for a yes. podcaster or YouTuber, like once yep. a week or something like that, you will make their day. <laughs> so we have just a few minutes left. Are there any other questions or comments? Oh, I love to hear that, that people mm-hmm. discovered podcasting through Grammar Girl. The um, the funny ones are like, oh, I listened, my teacher made me listen to this when I was in junior high, and now I'm using it as a teacher myself. And I'm like, oh, I'm so old. <laughs> 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 I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> oh, another little thing I just suddenly remembered about um the podcast way YouTube does podcasts is that if you re if you want to change an episode, if it's done as a podcast on YouTube, you can re upload and keep all of the, yeah, you can re up, at least that's what the thing said is that you can re up. If you're using the RSS feed, yeah. you can re upload one episode and it will get re uploaded and like maintain all of its metadata and all the rest of it, which is really funny because it's what you cannot do on the rest of YouTube and it yeah. drives YouTubers absolutely nuts that you can't do that. Like you made, made some terrible mistake or you want to cut something out of your episode, you can't re-upload. It just creates a new whole new video um, and you lose all the views and you lose all the et cetera, et cetera. But apparently with podcasts, if it's an RSS feed, you can, which is great. Hmm. Um, oh, there you go. You got Couple of other questions. Uh, in the chat too, Mignon. People who use uh, the episode. The oh, Grammar Girl. <clears throat> have I used the remix feature? Um, I used it on uh, not remix. I I I did the thing on TikTok a couple times where you um, answer someone's que- someone tagged me and asked a question and then I reacted. I think to that or answered that right. and that's fun because you know it's definitely it feels like you're almost having a conversation with them. It's a nice way to interact with people, but I haven't done a lot of it. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we haven't done that either. But Only when people like, reached out to me. Yeah. Any any yeah. favorite fails? There's a question. Uh, any favorite fails that others can learn from? <laughs> <laughs> I think mine are really, most of mine are like boring and technical. Like I uploaded the wrong audio. Oh. So it was the same <laughs> as the last one, like the wrong video. So my episode two, you know, 120 had the same audio as episode 119 which is obviously a problem, but not particularly fun. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and mine I've already mentioned is a, just say something in a, I, you know, I said something in a slightly confusing way and it led to a flame war in the comments that got me a huge number of views. So <laughs> I considered it a fail, but I, the algorithm I did not. I actually know YouTubers. <laughs> I do know educational YouTubers who will deliberately make an error, a trivial, a trivial error, like one that doesn't affect comprehension or like teach somebody a a falsehood or something, but will make a trivial error deliberately in each of their videos because they know people cannot help themselves from commenting (laughs) to correct it. And that will drive engagement and get the meta views. And part of me thinks that's terrible. And part of me thinks it's brilliant. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I I can't do it, but yeah, I it, I can see why people would, but I never could. No, <laughs> I suppose uh, if if you were being upfront about it and said and say off the top, I'm going to put an error in this. I want you to find it, and at least yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. you definitely do find the error. Yeah, yeah. 
that would be good. Yeah, that I, I, you know, though, that the way psychology of YouTube comments work, it wouldn't drive nearly as much traction as the mm. person who thinks they who thought they found, they thought they caught they you. Found, yeah, they caught you in a mistake. Absolutely, <laughs> that, that drives it. It's it's a it's a sad truth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're so right. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's also a few little technical details like um, making sure your audio is level. I mean, same things that you would for podcasting, but there's slightly different issues for the audio leveling and, and YouTube. And, you know, there's, uh, so you want to make sh you just read, read the tips in YouTube about what your audio levels should be so that it's not too quiet or too loud. I've done that a couple of times just because for whatever reason I exported it too quiet or something and the YouTube videos too too quiet but you know they're not again not particularly exciting <laughs> just slip shot <laughs> we, I, I, you here. know I, there was a funny thing that happened in one of the very first videos i made years ago i was outside on my balcony and there was an airplane going by in the um behind me and it looked like it went right in one ear <laughs> and like right <laughs> out the other and a bunch of people commented on that <laughs> that was a funny fail <laughs> oh that's good <laughs> well it looks like we're just about out of time so i would like to thank our panelists uh and thank uh all the attendees and um people who ask questions and took took part in the chat um i'll just say that from from mark and me uh our you know we're, we're very happy for people to reach out and ask any other follow-up questions if something occurs to you uh, I can't remember if our info is kicking around on the conference website, but um, I'll just I'll, I'll stick our our website in the uh, chat. Oops, no, I didn't. I just sent it directly to Mark. I will do that again. <laughs> and, and I think I know where I can find there. it. <laughs> um, uh, there's contact information there. Very happy to. Um, answer any questions if anyone wants to get in touch same here and i am on um, mastodon blue sky and threads yes yeah, i'm trying to get my my link here <laughs> and, um, but yeah thank you so much and uh enjoy the the rest of the symposium um, yeah, we'll see you around <laughs> we'll see you yeah